the modernists, they hope that their product projects are going to work. When they go to their meetings and they sit down for their listening sessions and their synod on synodality, you know, pillow fights, they think they're going to work. And I think when Pope Francis dies, which will be sooner rather than later, when he does die, I think it's going to be pretty tragic for the new springtime. Because this was the man that they thought would basically restore the church. And the opposite's happening. Go to thekennedyreport.com and visit the TKR store to see our new products, Kennedy's Choice Beard Oil. You can use this on your beard to help with alleviating itchiness, dryness, and irritation of skin. And don't worry, no animals were used in testing this product except for myself. Use Kennedy's Choice Beard Balm for a softer, healthier, manageable beard that is made with natural ingredients. And trust me, I know a thing or two about beards. Visit thekennedyreport.com and check out the TKR store. The links for this are in the description. So right now I'm actually reading through a book by John Sr. If you're not sure who he is, I recommend you look him up. I have to admit, I actually haven't read a lot of his stuff until recently. And I got to thank my friend Jim Vogel for for uh, hooking me up with his book on the restoration of the church. And, you know, it's interesting reading that book because if you haven't read it, I recommend you do. Uh, but he talks a lot about how we need to basically disconnect from the technocratic ways. And he actually wrote this in 1983. So I think he died in 1999. I can't imagine what he would have seen. This is a moose head, by the way. I think it's the best domestic Canadian lager. Anyway, in my, out of respect for John Sr. and his desire to have things more natural in a world where doing that and actually having what you say heard by others is basically impossible, I decided that I would try the next best thing and I would actually film outside beside my fire. And as you can probably see right now, the smoke is basically coming across the screen. So hopefully that doesn't make it too unwatchable after. So we'll see if firelight is enough. So in this book by John Sr., he goes through his reasoning why disconnecting from the television at, at that time when he was writing in 1983, that was the big deal. And uh, he does say, respectfully, smash your TV set. So I don't know what he'd say about smartphones. But uh, at any rate, his reasoning for it is essentially that the further you get away from the tactile, physical interactions, the less real something is. It works like this. You know, we call it virtual reality. Why? Because it's not actually reality. It's virtually real. It has the appearance of being real, but it's not. And the further you get away from what is actually real, the further you get away from reality. It does say a lot about our society that people essentially prefer to live in the metaverse or I don't know, is that Facebook? I don't, Facebook is called Meta now. I don't actually have Facebook. I don't know. Um, they prefer to play those video games what is that one where you wear the headset? I don't know. I've never played. I haven't played video games in like 20 years. Um, in any case, this is actually a pretty sound concept. And in fact, in the seminaries for the Society of St. Pius X, uh, you might not know this, but the seminarians basically aren't allowed to use computers. I think they have like one email address for the seminary and parents can sort of send emails to their kids if they want, you know, their sons. I don't know, whenever they're allowed to correspond. And they have to do all their assignments by hand, and they have to use books, they can't use computers. I think the only person who's allowed to use a computer is someone who's uh, deemed to be like the secretary or something, you know, has to take notes or something like that or perform some sort of task. Um, but no one's allowed to use much technology. And the reason why you're supposed to write by hand is because writing by hand is closer to the reality of what a word is. And the closest you can get to the reality of what a word is is the spoken word, 
which is why we see Christ, who is uh, sort of like the archetype of reality, hence why the old, uh, you know, the old philosophers and theologians like Thomas Aquinas would call themselves realists or even ultra-realists. You know, we think about Aristotle telling us that knowledge first comes through our senses. Is that, that is another way of saying knowledge first comes to us through reality. This is why we know that in the beginning was the word, because that spoken word from ultra reality himself, I guess, I'm kind of getting into the weeds here with my, my philosophical language, but there's just some wisdom to that. And it's not accidental that Christ is the divine word. Anyway, the further we get away from reality, the less real we become. The less real we become, the more artificial we become. And I think it, uh, it's not an accident that the biggest craze right now is artificial intelligence. It's not actually intelligence. It's essentially like super powerful Google. It's not actually sentient. It's not actually intelligence. But it does say something about our culture that will get to the point where Basically, a search engine seems like intelligence because we pretty much have separated ourselves from reality in so many ways. This entire preamble is meant to talk about the restoration of the church and why, after my conversations with people in St. Mary's, Kansas last week, especially with some priests, reading this book by John Sr., why I actually think the restoration of the church the end of the crisis in the church, is something that might actually be closer than we think. And I'm not talking about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart or some sort of miraculous warning. or I'm not talking about any sort of exceptional event. I'm just looking at trends, looking at human nature, looking at reality. And I actually think that the crisis itself is closer to its demise than its beginning. Let's put it that way. And here's the reason. So I was speaking with a, um, a priest of the site of St. Pius X. I won't say who it was because, you know, you don't, you don't want to uh, have everyone think that when you have a chat with them, you're, you're going to bring them up on a podcast. But I had many conversations with many priests, and this one really struck, uh, struck, uh, this stuck out to me. And this priest was explaining to me you know, how, you know, the crisis could last for 50 years or more, but at the same time, there are signs that it seems like it might come to an end sooner. And the reason was not because, again, of any exceptional event, but just because of the nature of the priesthood and the types of young priests that we're now seeing. And he was speaking about his correspondence with priests who are not traditional Catholic priests. These aren't priests in the SSPX. These aren't priests in the Fraternity of St. Peter instituted Christ the King, whatever. These are just diocesan priests. These are young men who, despite all the nonsense in their Novus Ordo parishes, they just decide to become priests. And it really is a choice that kind of goes against the grain. And he was explaining to me that, you know, in talking to these young priests, you know, they're, they're very much done with the Second Vatican Council. They don't care about it. They don't, you know, they write their reports and their essays and things like that that they have to graduate but it's like, you know, they're reading Lumen Gentium in their class, and then on their nightstand, if they're allowed to have it on their nightstand, depending on the seminary, you know, they're reading Thomas Aquinas and the Catechism of Trent and Vatican I, and, you know, they're reading Suarez and Bellarmine and, and, the, and these sorts of great saints of old. And that's really what they're forming themselves with. The point being is that they've rejected this unreality of the new springtime, so-called. They've rejected this fake Catholicism. And against all odds, they have found themselves answering a call to be a priest. And um, they don't have any intention of continuing the status quo. And it made me think, you know, it's 2023. Think about who our Pope is for just a second. Pope Francis is 
the archetype of the Vatican II priest. I'd have to check my dates. I do think he was actually ordained when, I think he was ordained before the new mass was promulgated, so he must have said a traditional mass or two. But in any case, he is, he is the archetype of the new mass priest. He hates tradition. He hates old catechisms. He basically thinks that doctrine can change. What did he say yesterday or a couple days ago? There was an article that came out. He was warning against indietrismo or backwardism, if you want to call it that. And um, he was actually chastising and castigating those who concerned themselves with restoration, as if wanting to restore the church would be so bad. Um, it was a terrible interview. It was your classic Francis, basically Gnostic gobbledygook. Um, but my point with this is, is that that generation is dying. That generation of priests, the priests in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, I mean, they're all close to retirement age, and they're, many of them are literally close to death. I mean, Pope Francis is in his mid-80s at this point. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not wishing to hasten the death of Pope Francis. Don't confuse my meaning. I hope that he dies in a state of grace and goes to heaven like everyone. Uh, but my point is, is that failed experiment of the Second Vatican Council is basically on life support. You know, I was in St. Mary's for the consecration of this beautiful church, and it's packed. Thousands and thousands of people. The basement is full. People standing outside for a dedication. That's a five-hour ceremony, for goodness sake. I think it was like four and a half hours between the actual ceremony and the high mass. A couple days later, there was like hundreds of kids being confirmed. You know, an order of priests that has no diocesan funding, has no massive endowment structure, doesn't have, you know, loads of property from the city or anything that these old dioceses have, is able to build a $42 million church in like two and a half years, um, you know, literally with no help, from except for from the generous people. But the point is, is nothing from any structure, nothing from any deep financial pockets, you know, based in centuries of, of, of money for some diocese. And you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? It means that Catholic faithful who actually have the faith are willing to fork out millions, tens of millions of dollars just to have Catholicism. It's unbelievable. This experiment of the Second Vatican Council, it's going to die. This new mass paradigm is going to die. There's going to be no one left at it. I mean, will there be a new mass in 15 to 20 years? I mean, I, I'm serious. I mean, think about the parishes. Yes, there are exceptions. But by and large, your average New Mass parish in your average city, people attend mainly out of habit. There are, and that's a small percentage of the baptized Catholics, there are a select few people in every parish that actually do follow the teachings of the church and they have big families. But many of them, their children are finding tradition, and this actually causes a lot of friction in, in a lot of Catholic families, I've found. Many of them leave the church. The churches are being downsized. They're empty. They're being amalgamated into families of parishes. Dioceses are going bankrupt because of sexual abuse settlements. You know, we could keep going. But the point is, is that you compare that with the average family that goes to a traditional parish that has, you know, between 5 and 15 children. In 10 to 15 years in the Novus Ordo, you're going to have a massive exodus by way of going to their great reward because the vast majority of parishioners are elderly. Whereas on the other hand, in the traditional parishes, you're going to have, uh, you know, like a hockey stick growth. 
you know, the growth of, of, of people going to the traditional mass in these parishes is going to look like inflation under Justin Trudeau during the so-called pandemic. And none of those people want the Second Vatican Council. None of those people want the new mass. None of those people want the new springtime. They want Catholicism. They want the mass of all time. The restoration of the church, I, sure, there could be some miraculous event. There could be something that some mystic prophesied. I'm not going to hold my breath. It could happen. And if it does, great. That'd be fun. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way. It could just be that in 10 to 15 to 20 years, the fulcrum between modernism and tradition kind of flips in a different direction. There will be no cronies for the Lavender Mafia left alive. They'll all be in nursing homes or be dead. The pope splainers will run out of things to pope splain <laughs> because it'll just be impossible. And what's going to be left is going to be tradition, which is the will of God. And everything else will have faded away. Now, it could take much longer than 15 to 20 years. Maybe I'm being optimistic. But personally, I just can't see how it can continue. What reason do we have to believe that these parishes that just can't keep parishioners and are walking off a demographic cliff... What reason do we have to believe that they're going to somehow have a major turnaround? All we've seen is decline in the last 50, 60 years in those parishes. Why would they suddenly experience an incline? You know, I don't know when Pope Francis is going to die. And again, I'm not hoping that he dies anytime soon. I hope that he dies in a state of grace whenever he dies. And we should all pray for that. We should all be praying for the Pope multiple times a day. When you wake up in the morning, say your morning prayers. Say an Hail Mary for the Pope. Say an Our Father on the Rosary for the Pope. Pray from before you go to bed. We should all be praying for the Pope more than we do. But when he dies, what's going to die with him is going to be, well, when Pope Francis dies, he is the archetype of the new mass priest. He's the new mass Pope par excellence. You know, he's had his basically his whole priesthood. Remember the old Pope's they still had a little bit of tradition in their bones, as, as hard as it was to find sometimes. They could pull out, they could pull tradition out of the hat whenever they had to appease somebody. Francis doesn't even care to do that. <laughs> he calls, uh, he calls you know, traditionalists mentally disturbed and things. He doesn't care. When he dies, I personally think that it's going to be pretty obvious that that experiment of Vatican II is going to die with him, or at least begin to decay rapidly. You know, when he was elected... I remember they talked about the Francis effect. Because here's the, here's the thing. The modernists, even though they hate the truth and they hate Catholicism ultimately, they still have a little bit of institutional pride. You know, they still want to see their Catholic universities full. They still want to see, they still want to see their parishes full. I mean, for, any, for, any, for anything, just for community. I mean, it's very natural. I mean, in the same way, I mean, Protestants don't have the truth. But, of course, on a very natural level, you just want to see people in the pews. I mean, you want, to th you want to think that what you're doing is being validated in some way. And I remember when he was elected, everyone was talking about the Francis effect. And I have to admit, at that time, you know, 2013, 14, 15, I was just discovering sort of traditional conservative Catholicism, and I was kind of a liberal. And I was very hopeful. I mean, everyone was talking about this Francis effect. And I remember talking to a very jaded, probably not very faithful, I'm being a little bit judgmental here, but just knowing the person. He was an older teacher when I was in this Catholic school system. And I said, do you think the Francis effect is going to have any benefit to the church? People are going to come back to the church. And he said, no. And he was being very honest. He was kind of a cynic, but he just said, you know, nobody wants it. It's done. I think he was right. And I don't think it was coming from a place of deep faith. He wasn't a traditionalist. I just think he kind of thought religion was over, you know, and Francis couldn't stop that. But my point with this is that the modernists, they hope that their projects are going to work. When they go to their meetings 
and they sit down for their listening sessions and their synod on synodality, you know, pillow fights, they think they're going to work. That's the amazing thing. Yes, they're contributing to the destruction of the church, but when they go have their meetings, they think that when they get a busload of Catholic high school students to come to some encounter session, kids who don't even go to church 99% of the time, they think that that's evidence that what they're doing is working. And I think when Pope Francis dies, which will be sooner rather than later, again, God save his soul and, and please pray for the Pope. When he does die, I think it's going to be pretty tragic for the new springtime because this was the man that they thought would basically restore the church and the opposite's happening. People are leaving even faster under Pope Francis, leaving the Novus Ordo, that is. They're flocking to tradition. In any case, I don't know if the dots have been connected here. We started with recording by the fire, talking about John Sr., moving on to the restoration of the church. But if you can follow me here, I personally think those of us in our 30s and 40s, I think by the time our kids are grown or we're starting to have grandkids, I think that it might actually be pretty possible that that Novus Ordo parish in your town, that Los Alts parishioners, I think we might see a lot of these being retrofitted for the traditional mass. And I think tradition might actually make a big comeback. And if we see the restoration of the church, I don't think we should be surprised. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless. And smash your TV. Get rid of it. And don't watch my videos more than you need to. And sit beside a fire and unplug if you can. Cheers. Go to thekennedyreport.com and visit the TKR store to see our new products, Kennedy's Choice Beard Oil. You can use this on your beard to help with alleviating itchiness, dryness, and irritation of skin. And don't worry, no animals were used in testing this product except for myself. Use Kennedy's Choice Beard Balm for a softer, healthier, manageable beard that is made with natural ingredients. And trust me, I know a thing or two about beards. Visit thekennedyreport.com and check out the TKR store. The links for this are in the description.